Welcome to the Catholic Gentleman Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a man who lives with virtue and how to grow in holiness in today's world. Today, we get to hear the artistry and tradition involved in making, smoking, and actually experiencing a cigar. We are joined by a master cigar maker, and the conversation takes us all over the world into the riches of the Catholic faith, how to overcome the tough times life often presents us with, and the joy and deepening of relationships that can happen over a cigar. You are guaranteed to learn a lot with this episode, so I hope you enjoy. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on another episode of the Catholic Gentleman Podcast. We're so happy you joined us. We are your co-hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. And uh, we're just so happy you're here. And just one reminder, uh, check out CatholicGentlemanPlus.com. Uh, we've been working really hard on producing some amazing content for you there. Um, there's some next level like spiritual wisdom from some just genuine uh, masters of the spiritual life. Uh, experts on the faith, uh, theologians, and and uh, you know, uh, just very wise men. That so it's not just me and John talking. Uh, you'll you'll get some real input from some really wise men. So I'll leave it at that. Just check out CatholicGentlemanPlus.com and see if it's something that interests you, something that can help take your spiritual life to the next level. Um, but without further ado, I'm very excited about this episode because I've been I've, it's been a long time coming and I wanted to to have our today's guest on for quite a while now. Uh, but he, he is a fascinating guy um, and uh, we'll be introducing him here in a minute. But if you like cigars, you're going to like this episode. Uh, uh, Tomas is a cigar maker. Um, and Tomas, can you remind me your last name? How do you pronounce that? It's Baldonado. 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 Okay. Yeah. So Tomas Baldonado, he lives here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I live as well, uh, and has been a cigar maker for a number of years now, and has kind of built a reputation here in the area as just a master of his craft and someone who uh, gives classes and has a, one of the most unique things in the United States, like a micro uh, cigar shop where he... Uh, manufactures cigars locally here in a in a storefront, and and it's uh, we'll hear we'll hear more about his business and how that got started here in a minute. But just just real briefly by way of introduction, uh, Tomas has a fascinating history. Uh, very young age, he started traveling the world and had visited fourteen countries by the age of twenty five. Uh, tried a lot of different jobs, but eventually uh, found his way to a cigar shop. Uh, and offered to work for free, which is which is a bold move, gutsy move there. Uh, but I was so interested in learning that craft that he started uh, for free and ended up uh, really excelling at that business and helping it grow um, and traveled to South America to uh, learn from the best in the cigar business uh, there in South America and countries like uh, Honduras and Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. Um, and further on, um, built a successful wine business, um, and now he's back to cigars. So very accomplished in this world of um, just the the finer things in life, wine and cigars. And and so anyway, I, we're we're excited to hear about your story and how you ended up making cigars for a living. Um, but welcome, Tomas. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys uh, reaching out. Awesome. Well, just to get the ball rolling, um, we are, I am I am uh, personally fascinated by your story. But before we get to that, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the hot topic here, which we've discussed before, but I think is relevant. Um, and that is is smoking a sin? Because uh, right away when you jump dive into this topic, you know that you you get a lot of feedback. Hey, you know your your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is true. Um, you're not allowed to do anything that damages that temple. Smoking damages your body, therefore, smoking is bad. And uh, we, you know, we, but Catholic gentlemen, we have pipes in our logo, so we've been hearing this question over and over ever pretty much since the beginning of like, is smoking a sin? Are Christians allowed to smoke? 
and growing up Baptist, like, you know, smoking was a big no, no. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, what's your take on is smoking a sin? Sure. Um, so kind of going to the body as the temple thing, and it's about poisoning your body, uh, to give a little bit of background with regard to the science of cigars, particularly, um, there's a significant difference between cigarettes and cigars. A premium cigar is 100% natural product that goes through a natural fermentation process. Uh, with regard to FDA findings, uh, you can smoke up to two large cigars per day without having any uh, traceable contribution to negative health effects. Uh, the majority of cigar smokers do not smoke large, two large cigars per day. Um, in fact, I smoke one cigar a week, if that, um, and and that's about the extent of what my consumption is. And so. Um, so with regard to the aspect of whether it's poisoning your body or not, uh, the reason why a cigar has less negative health effects is one, because of the natural content. But in addition to that, the fact that you do not inhale the cigar, it's more about the pleasure of the flavor and the, the experience that you're having while consuming that cigar, uh, whether it be time alone to meditate and think about your day and think about your uh, what's going on in your life. A lot of times people see that as a positive health effect uh, because it forces somebody to take an hour to an hour and a half to really um, uh, look internally within yourself and, and give you that time alone or uh, potentially an opportunity to uh, join your friends and have commune with others and enjoy a cigar together, which is also a big part of spirituality and, and, and part of who you are as a person and forming your, your identity uh, with the people around you. And so, uh, so there's a, a lot of positive social aspects of it, uh, internal aspects of it, uh, just as much as any other hobby that you might have, um, with regards to the negative health effects, it's very minimal. And, and many studies have proven that a premium cigar, uh, can have, uh, very minimal, if not, uh, not at all, a non-existing negative contributions to health effects. So, wow. so in other words, you're not harming the temple. You're just incensing the temple. Uh, <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> wow. And yeah, I'm so grateful for you bringing that up. That is, that's really great for us to hear because we live in a society today, right? Where um, we have this uh, sense of, uh, yeah, again, that tobacco is a sin or something like that. And we know that, you know, this error that has been created, that uh, things of God or things of the material world could be sinful in and of themselves is wrong, right? It's taken different form, Jansenism, Calvinism, Puritanism, you name it, different heresies have come up, but there really is that thought of, of uh, smoking a sin. And um, and then the fact that you went right to it, because we think about this all the time, right? When you look at studies that talk about the carcinogenic effect of cigarettes, actually, is what I was thinking of. It's people that are smoking a, a pack a day. It's it's not somebody that just smokes one cigarette a day. In fact, I don't even know if you can find a study uh, that, that just narrows it down to somebody who's just smoking a cigarette or two a day. Um, but the point is not arguing for the sake uh, of cigarette, but just against this notion that it is sinning, right? And that there is so much more that we could go into, because I was actually going to talk about the health benefits. You talked about the social benefits, which are great, right? St. Jose Maria Escriva, I like to bring that up. He used to require some of his men in his order to smoke so that they could be more relatable and more evangelizing to the people within their culture. So there can actually be very positive goods that are brought into it outside of um, you know, the addictive tendencies or things like that. And that's just it. If you find yourself falling into an addiction, right? An addiction is a spiritual imperfection that must be overcome and something that we need to work on. And, um, but that doesn't mean that the tobacco in and of itself is wrong or is bad. Now, I know that we're going to be speaking this and there's going to be people who are triggered, who already have their notion that, that, um, that smoking is a sin. And I tell you, and just directly, if that is you, and you really do argue that smoking is a sin, you are um, speaking and thinking contrary to the teaching of the church, because if it was a sin, the church would have spoken out against it. What is sinful is excess, but since virtue is found in the means, and virtue in the means is dependent on each individual, that person has to discern for themselves and be guided and directed by themselves. So anyways, I'm just, uh, could go on this topic for quite a while, but the fact that you went directly to two cigars a day, having zero, uh, negative health benefits. I'm just, I want to come back to that because that's, 
I thought I would assume yeah. that uh, that that would be too many, to be honest. For it would be probably too many for myself, for sure. Um, but uh, but likewise, and then I'm just going to finish before letting you talk and, and uh, discuss that. When I smoke a pipe, right? Like really, the most that I ever fall into pipe smoking is is once a week or, or, you know, and honestly more infrequent now that I've got a lot of kids, um, rolling around. So any additional thoughts to these things that I'm, um, conjuring up right now? Well, I will say that, um, uh, you know, annually I do participate in a men's Catholic camp out or, uh, with another organization and uh, we do cigar rolling classes and oftentimes, and this is takes place at a monastery here in Oklahoma. And oftentimes we will do, uh, have one of the priests or the monks come around and, and express their interests in what we're doing with the cigars. Uh, sometimes we'll have one of the uh, one of the priests actually participate in the class. Um, and so it's a big part of the culture of that event uh, with the cigars and sitting around the campfire and sharing commune and, and um, a little bit of bourbon. Um, and so with regard to the church and the Catholic faith, uh, you know, I haven't encountered any uh i guess you could say anybody shutting it down uh in fact it seems to be celebrated as a opportunity for for men to gather and and have that commonality between them and sharing their spirituality uh, with regard to cigarettes um you know people don't understand that with a cigar and with pipe tobacco, there's a more premium quality of tobacco that's used. With cigarettes, they use the entire plant, and that's the stalk, the veins, the roots, and all of that. They chop that tobacco plant up, they dehydrate it, they make a pulp out of it, add over 300 chemicals, uh, and then they add non-tobacco filler. They spread that out in sheets, allow it to dry, they chop it back up, and then that's what goes into a cigarette. The uh, addictive aspect of the cigarette is not necessarily derived directly from the tobacco that's uh, content, the tobacco content in the cigarette. The addictive quality is derived from the chemical compounds and the additional uh, nicotine that is added that creates the addictive qualities. And that's the difference between a cigar, which just has the natural nicotine content, which is minimal uh, compared to a cigarette, um, and, and that's why, where you get into more of cigars being more of a hobby and people can enjoy one a month, one every six months on occasion for a holiday celebratory cigar or once a week if that's what they choose. And oftentimes it's more about the experience than the cigar itself, um, experience of flavor, experience of variety or the experience of sharing with the people that you're with. Uh, and so it's a very different characteristic and different purpose for a, a person to consume a cigar versus a, a cigarette. Um, and so I think that that something that the difference needs to be uh, correlated with the, the purpose of why you're smoking and, uh, and how that's benefiting or harming your psyche or your physical body. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I love you going back to this communal aspect. I mean, uh, um, as always, I have a Chesterton quote handy, but, uh, you know, Ch Chesterton said, Puritanism is pouring righteous indignation into all the wrong things. Um, and I, I think that's true because, you know, like you said, there's this communal aspect to this. This is not something that's just like an isolated activity or an addiction, which addictions almost always isolate you in some some respect. Whereas an activity like smoking a cigar forces you to slow down. Uh, it forces you to think like you were saying earlier and like just bond with your brothers. Like men generally need a shared activity to get that conversation flowing. It's hard for men to just sit there and talk to each other. It's like, but if you're doing something shared, shared experience, there's immediately this conversation that bubbles up and, 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 uh, you know, there's actually a lot of this is kind of a heresy, but if you actually look at a, a lot of uh, the medical research, nicotine actually has a lot of benefits um, to your brain. It's a brain stimulant. It prevents things like Alzheimer's and things like that. So so it, it actually can stimulate that conversation that might not otherwise be there. Um, so so, yeah, let's think carefully before we just rush to condemn um you know especially things that the church doesn't condemn um let's let's stop and use our reason and think through things i mean sugar there's a lot, lots of evidence that sugar is even more destructive and addictive than nicotine or tobacco 
And yet, you know, our culture is very selective about which things it decides to condemn. Um, so let's just slow down. Let's use right reason here, use prudence, and actually think through these issues. So I, lo I love that perspective. Um, but moving along, like, I'm just interested in your story. Okay, you can say, yeah. if, a fascinating story. Like visiting 14 countries, I think, you know, I visited like two countries in my whole life. Like you have 14 countries by the age of 25. That's amazing. Like what sparked that wanderlust, if you will? And like, how did you end up traveling in the world so young? What were you looking for? And like, what did you experience? Love yeah, well, a big part of the, the traveling aspect was uh, just curiosity. You know, I was an I was an artist. I used to do oil painting and wood sculpture and, and showed my art in museums and galleries and did some traveling with that. Um, I always worked hard um, in high school. I used to work two jobs while I was in high school. And after high school, I would work three jobs. And um, and I would work the three jobs, take the summers, quit the three jobs or take a break uh, and then do some traveling and visited <laughs> Western Europe, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Poland, um, kind of all over Western Europe and uh, come back and get three new jobs. And that's kind of how I kind of ended up backwards in the cigar industry. Um, I ended up meeting this gentleman who had opened up a second cigar shop, was looking for somebody to work for him. I was in the process of looking for another job and uh to save money again and uh he he was said i'm gonna be honest with you i'd rather hire an old white guy <laughs> and i said well, why is that he says well he's got nowhere else to go but be a greeter at walmart and i could pay him ten dollars an hour and i know he's not going to steal from me and so i told him I'll tell you what i'll work for you for free for two days um i didn't know anything about cigars and i said uh, if, if you don't like me you send me packing and you'll never see me again if i don't like the job I, I won't bother you, but at the end of the two days, if, if everything works out, I promise I'll stick around and I'll help your company grow. And um, within a year and a half, I ran the business. We ended up growing to five retail stores. Our lar largest store was 2,500 square foot walk-in humidor. Um, I decided to go and start de developing an online business. So I taught myself PHP, JavaScript, HTML, developed the website that became very successful. And, um, you know, we just had the debate over partnership and ownership he was already you know he was living away i was running the business and uh, eventually i got to a point where i just said you know what i, I need to step away and you know we, at the time we had over four million dollars in inventory we were wow. very successful and uh, i walked away with nothing and i went into the wine and spirits industry uh, working for brokers and different brands and uh, visiting distilleries and wineries and uh, eventually ended up in oklahoma in 2013 um, and decided to uh, kind of branch out. It got hired by a Native American tribe and they asked that myself and two other gentlemen build a wine company for them. And we did that, uh, traveled around the country visiting different Native American tribes and the cigar industry thing came back up uh, working with the Winnebago tribe. Um, we started talking about my history and what industries I was in and how I visited the Central American factories. And, and we started talking about Native American culture and the history of the Native American uh, community and tobacco and uh, how every cigar store has a Native American uh, Indian statue uh, holding cigars, but there weren't any Native American tribes that have cigar brands. And uh, so the conversation kind of came up in tying in the tobacco and the history of tobacco and, and heirloom seeds and how some of these tribes still have heirloom seeds and seed banks and things like that which really sparked my interest back into the cigar industry again. And, uh, and so I started putting together a business model. It didn't work out. You know, I went through all of this licensing and permitting and did all this stuff for eight months. And uh, my original business model ended up not working out and then being able to evolve and adapt and look at the blessings in, in the failures. And, and I think that People often ask me about how we make cigars and how our business functions. And, and, and I always tell them it's been an evolution of, of failure, essentially, mm -hmm. and need. And, and every time something comes up, every time a, a barrier would come up, you know, my job as a business owner is, and, and somebody who is am, am trying to fulfill an ambition is to pivot. Uh, always look for the opportunities to pivot. Look for the opportunities to adapt to the market, adapt the business model, um, looking at multiple streams of revenue. And, and so that way, when one thing dries up, another thing flourishes. And, and, and so always looking for that opportunity. And so the model and how we manufacture is, 
it's very different than traditional manufacturing. It's still 100% handmade. It's still done with natural fermented leaf that doesn't go through any chemical processing. It's still fundamentally the same as any premium hand rolled cigar, but the process in which we age the tobacco and roll the cigar and go to market uh, with that product is is, uh, meant to be more nimble and flexible than traditional manufacturing. So we are able to operate in -in just-in-time inventory so we can train people faster, so we can be able to have more flexibility in the model. And, uh, and it's just been an evolution through uh, through keeping that that mindset of, of when one door closes, another one opens and God always leaves a window open. And, you know, you kind of have to look at it that way and have that positive mindset. And so um, so it's just been this evolution of, of getting us to where we are today and and where we'll go tomorrow. Yeah, I know that is such a story. And I just love the resourcefulness of it. The fact that you were a man on a mission that you were a man uh, that, uh, that could accept failure, and then uh, see past it to uh, the future. I imagine that didn't come overnight. And actually, that's where I want to kind of gear back towards is, I'd like to talk about when you had this, um, I presume a rupture or divide from your um, business partner. I, I understand he wasn't a partner, he was the owner and, and you were working for him, but it had come to that situation where you were more actively involved. And, um, you know, when you when you left that, um, talk about to us about some of the emotions that you experienced, some of the things that, I mean, did you fall, was there a certain degree of despair or was it always the positive attitude? I mean, uh, t- talk to us a little bit about uh, what you've had to learn, uh, you know, as sure. a man, growing up as a man and not falling back into, you know, kind of the selfishness or self-pity or these sort of things. I'd love to just hear from you and the wisdom that you've learned because clearly in how you just explained your growth, there's a depth of, of reflection that you have um, uh, experienced in your life. Yeah. So for me personally, um, you know, and I understand that it's not everybody's personality, you know, and it's not easy for everybody. And I've always been the mindset of uh, my struggles aren't necessarily more difficult than the next person because my capacity for handling things and taking on uh, the struggle might be different than the next person's capacity. And so, you know, for me growing up um, kind of in a divorced home and and having to take on a lot of roles, uh, adult roles at at a young age has really allowed me to be able to see past myself in many of these things. So uh, going into, uh, for example, you know, the art, my art career at the time, um, when I was 17 to 19 years old and traveling, I've always been kind of the, of the mindset of, uh, I take it as it comes, you know, because there's no guarantees for tomorrow. Yes. And, uh, and there's power in, in saying yes to things. And, um, and, and that's always been my mindset of, of being prepared to receive the blessings when they come. Uh, I think that a lot of times people block their blessings by being uh, closed off to it, uh, by letting a one struggle in one part of your life uh, shadow cast a shadow in every other part of your life, and and that blocks blessings. And so I've always been the kind of person that this may be a struggle here in this part of my life, but I need to be able to. Um, uh, not prioritize that struggle over everything else. And, uh, and and I think that's been a blessing in my life, even though, uh, you know, Dimitri, the gentleman that I was in business with, he and I did have a, a partnership in one aspect of the business and I was an employee in another aspect of the business and things were always a struggle between he and I. Um, there was a lot of divide going on. Uh, and, and I, you know, when I left, I didn't see it as, you know, this guy is now going to go off and be a millionaire, which he did off of the work that I put in and all the effort that I put in. And, you know, it wasn't about me and him. It was about, I see more value in myself and I have uh, this sense of uh, self-worth that I wasn't going to allow him to continue to capitalize on uh, without without myself receiving the, the reward as well and being equally shared in, from my perspective. And so 
it wasn't a matter of despair. It was a matter of having pride in oneself yeah, and, justice, and looking yeah. for and looking for for opportunity elsewhere to to be able to get that sense of of, of value and, and self worth. And so uh, so moving into the wine and spirits industry, it was an easy transition. I already knew people. I had relationships. And and I had the offers there. Again, it's even though I had the the, the the struggle going on in one aspect of my life, I didn't close myself off to the blessings that were being offered in another aspect of my life. And so it was an easy transition to move forward into the wine and spirits industry for the next thirteen years, because I was always always being open to it. And um, more opportunity came, and more more blessings would come from that, from being open to those opportunities. And then, as I mentioned, you know, when I when I started this cigar business, uh, you know, I was working. I had a full time job. My my original business model was going to be to import cigars, going back to Central America, looking at my relationships that I had, pulling on that and tying that in with the Native American aspects of things. And then also my travels abroad, you know, uh, originally it was going to be importing cigars for Native American tribes to then have their own brands, which we can then build a portfolio of Native American owned cigar brands and then actually export that into western europe uh having traveled to germany and austria and switzerland and a lot of those countries have a very strong infatuation with the native american culture um but not not necessarily just the fact that they have the, this infatuation with the culture but they're also a large consumer market for premium cigars mm -hmm. so the idea would be was very different than what it is today it went from just importing cigars and going through eight months of licensing to then I got my permits on Wednesday and on Friday I lost my job. And so I had no capital. I had no resources, uh, you know, and I had to, I had to support myself and my family and bills to pay. And I had to pay rent on a, on a commercial space. And so I started with a table in an empty building with space heaters to keep my feet warm over the winter because I didn't have money to turn on the gas. Mm -hmm. um, and so it went from one totally different business model to well, I guess I got to learn how to, you know, take on, 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 figure out how to learn how to run a cigar factory, how to start making the cigars myself. Uh, take this five pounds of tobacco that I have on hand um, and turn that into a business. And, uh, and so, you know, luckily for me, I had relationships in the wine business and I called on some people that I knew and said, hey, I'm going to start making cigars. Uh, would you be interested in offering them in your cigar shop? Uh, and people trusted me. They trusted my character. They trusted my reputation. And without ever tasting the cigars, they're like, you got a customer. Just let us know when you're ready. And uh, and so, again, looking at that failure and, and that change and pivoting and seeing this, you know what, this might be a blessing. This might be more of a way for me to control what I'm going to do. Maybe God didn't see what I was doing as the best thing for me to do right now. Uh, perhaps it was a way to avoid a pitfall and pivot me more toward where my strengths are. And so then that changed into, I'm going to make the cigars myself. And then it turned into, well, customers were coming back and saying the cigars were too wet, too moist. They're, they're plugged. They weren't able to draw air through them. Uh, so then I said, well, I got to build a machine that's going to allow me to test the cigars. And then it was looking at all these different failures and how can I re-engineer the process to eliminate the variables that create failure? And, and that's what that's kind of like a to me, that's like a, an analogy for life. Right. It's like, how do you look for the variables that are uh, causing failure in your life? Or for me, it was the cigars. Um, and how can I create a new process? that eliminates those variables that are causing the failure. So that way I don't have to learn and train people how to live, how to work around those failure points, right? And I think that's that's something that is a good analogy for life in, in, in that, you know, I'm making these mistakes. Uh, I'm having, I'm seeing failure because of these things in, in what I am doing in this process and it's not working. So how can I change the process to eliminate those variables. And that's what, caught, what allowed us to have this flexibility. That's what allowed us to pivot and allowed me to survive through COVID in the business model and, and survive through economic downturn and all of these other things. You know, it's, it's a constant pivot. We went on to have a lounge next door. I took over the space next door, but tobacco prices after COVID have gone up. 
So I had to make a decision. Do I raise my prices and, and, and become less competitive? Or do I just let that space go and not let my pride get in the way? Mm. And, uh, and, and, and be able to reduce my overhead, maintain my pricing and keep my customers. And so, you know, and, and I think that's always been a big part of the evolution of myself and my business model is um, always looking for, for those opportunities to do better and, and not let your pride get in the way and not force something that's not natural. I want to take a moment and I want to thank all of our current sponsors and our donors. We are so grateful for the help that you have given us over the years. It is because of you that we have been able to expand our reach to millions of men in hundreds of uh, countries to help expand the vision and mission of what it means to be a man and be a saint, which is exactly what the Catholic Gentleman is about. So. Over the next three weeks, we have a very unique request that we are going to be asking new donors to help us with. And yeah, to make a long story short, we uh, previously recorded our podcast and our Got a Gentleman Plus premium content in a studio out of state for both of us. And there's various reasons for that. But we were renting equipment, we were renting studio space. And in order to use our donor money more wisely and more efficiently, we really want to bring that studio back home to Texas. And in order to do that though, we have to purchase some equipment to build that studio because again, we're not renting it anymore. We need to buy our own equipment in order to record things um, in, a, in a home studio. So what we really need is your support to make that happen uh, because uh, it's, it's, not, it's not cheap. We have a number in mind. We need to raise $3,000 and that's the bare minimum. We've whittled it down to the bare minimum that we need to make this happen. There's no extravagances here, no fluff here. This is the equipment that we need to continue to produce high quality content for people like you. And we want to do this because our hearts are in this. You know, we want to serve men, but we need your support and your help. Um, so that's that's the ask. Absolutely. So if you are um, open to giving us a portion of that $3,000, five, 10, 20, 100, Whatever it is that you can give, head over to catholicgentleman.com slash support. You can head over to catholicgentleman.com and you can click on the support button. It's going to take you to the same page. And over the next three weeks, for all the donation dollars that come in at catholicgentleman.com slash support, we're going to give you three free months of the Catholic Gentleman Plus, which is our exclusive membership platform that has a ton of things uh, going on with it. And so for the next three weeks, anybody that gives is going to receive three months of the Catholic Gentleman Plus as a thank you for helping us continue to expand our mission, continue to elevate the content that we are creating, and honestly save money over time so that we can continue to do this and be wise stewards of uh, the donation dollars that are coming in. Yeah, thank you again for your support as you prayerfully consider giving something to this goal, and uh, we appreciate anything that you can manage, uh, no matter how small that might be. Uh, so thank you so much for supporting high quality Catholic content. That's a, that's amazing. You know, if any native Chinese speakers are listening, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the Chinese character for, for obstacle also means opportunity. Um, and your, your life has been uh, a, an illustration of that. Um, and it's very inspiring how like, you've always been able to pivot and, and find those lessons in each challenge that you've been faced with and learn and grow through that. And so I just, I find that super inspiring. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Myself as well. But, but um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, you, you've learned so much over the years, like you were saying about how good cigars are made, you know, and, and what, you know, leaf is, is the best and like, you know, built this incredible, storehouse of knowledge in your own mind of how to make a good cigar and i would love if you could just give us a brief um i know there's probably a lot but like if you give us a brief rundown of like what makes for a good cigar what are some of the things that you look for when you're considering making a, a new blend or a new cigar like um what what goes into that because i think a lot of us you know may enjoy a good cigar but we may not know all the ins and outs of how it's actually made and the craft behind that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple aspects of it. One is the uh, anatomy of the cigar itself, right? So you have filler leaf that makes up the majority of your flavor. Uh, you have a binder leaf, which is going to hold the tobacco together once you've bunched it up. 
Okay. Once we press it in the molds, we get a uniform shape and size, and then we have a final wrapper leaf, which is going to be more of your cosmetic, and it's also going to impart some aspect of flavor as well. And so I call my business, uh, named it Ultimo, in Spanish means ultimate, for a reason. It also means last, uh, because to me, this was the ultimate culmination of my life's experiences, and it's the last thing I'm going to do uh, for myself this time. Uh, you know, I've built businesses, I've built models, I've built things for other people, and that's been my career. But the great thing about it is that this is an ultimate culmination of my career, being in the cigar industry, the wine and spirits industry, and training for flavor and taste. In the wine and spirits industry, I was worked with high-end cognacs, champagnes, glassware companies like Rito Glassware, uh, bourbons, scotches, vodkas. My whole career for 13 years in the, in the wine and spirits industry was training my palate. And then prior to that, working with the manufacturers and developing developing blends and things like that was also training my palate. And so when I develop a cigar, I'm looking at the anat anatomical responser, uh, responses to taste. Uh, on the palate, we have different levels of sensitivity in different zones of the palate to different qu uh, qualities and characteristics of flavor. For example, at the tip of the tongue is where we get the majority of spice. Behind that, you get sweet. The sides of the tip of the tongue is salty. On the far sides of the palate, you're going to get acid. The mid palate is creaminess and fats, so or in Japanese, they call it umami. And on the back of the palate, uh, it's bitter and savory. And so when I'm developing a cigar, we're looking for dimension and looking to be able to trigger um, in a specific uh, order the palate in, in different ways. And it's going to be dependent on the experience we want the consumer to have. So if we're saying this cigar pairs with bourbon, um, we're looking at, I'm looking at, is it a weeded bourbon? Is it a rye bourbon? What type of bourbon are you drinking? If it's scotch, is it single malt scotch? Is it Highland scotch? Is it um, a blended scotch? Uh, and so we can have the cigar be a complementary flavor profile. We also look at, for example, acidity and alkaline for pH balance. Um, so there's a lot of anatomy that goes into the blending and development of flavor in a cigar beyond the anatomy of the cigar itself. The process by which we engineer the cigar and create the experience is really gonna be focused on how it smokes, um, the draw in terms of the air passing through and construction. And that's what I've engineered a different process for. But when it comes to the experience of flavor, um, and the overall um, aromatics and, and tastes and, and the anatomical response to taste, um, that's where it's not just anybody can do that part of it. It's a lot of trial and error unless you have a good foundation of, of knowledge of how flavor is developed. Um, because we're looking at residual oils, lingering mouthfeel, smoke density, uh, as well as triggering taste buds and and how they're going to experience that cigar. Is it going to be, are you smoking this cigar on a hot day on the golf course or at the lake? Is that cigar going to make you ill? Are you going to get dizzy? Are you going to have, you know, kind of a, a stomach ache because of the heat and the exhaustion and dehydration? So you don't want a cigar that's going to be too strong and too bold for that experience. Uh, or are you going to have it with coffee in the morning? You want a cigar that's going to be a, a little bit low alkaline, a little bit lighter, so that way you don't have astringency with the acidity in the, in the coffee. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes into it in developing cigars. So every cigar that we produce is produced with a purpose. But in addition to doing all of that, we also do custom blending. We have clients all over the world where we make cigars to individuals' tastes. So we have clients where we make one cigar for that person and for their palate and nobody else in the world has access to that cigar unless they add them on the authorized buyers lists mm -hmm. and so to do that process they go through an entire experience and it starts with filling out a profile we have 12 different tasting notes on our website they give us a list of, of cigars that are their inspiration i actually buy the cigars smoke the cigars and experience it with their taste palette in mind that allows me to draw from uh, from those cigars what they're looking for, uh, extrapolate common flavor elements, smoke density, construction, draw characteristics. All of those aspects are then taking into consideration in developing a cigar for that person. And then they receive a kit. They sample through this kit where they get to taste each individual leaf in the cigar. They taste the naked bunch, which is the 
cigar without the final wrapper on it. And then they taste two different variations of a final blend uh, to give us a spectrum of flavor. Once they go through that kit, then they're going to give us feedback. We make tweaks as necessary to their feedback, send them a new sample. Once we finalize that cigar, that is their cigar. And nobody else in the world can access that cigar. And again, that's we are the only factory in the world that provides a service like that. And that's because of the process by which we manufacture. Um, because we have over 60 different types of leaf on hand, whereas most factories have 20 types of leaf on hand. Um, because we go from leaf to smoke in 24 hours, whereas most factories go from leaf to smoke in three to 12 months. And so our process uh, eliminates a lot of variables that would be prohibitive of being able to have such a program uh, and it allows us to, to, to be able to offer this unique service that nobody in the world can do. And of course, that is also very dependent on my ability to, uh, to develop the flavor for that person to be able to understand the anatomy and the anatomical aspects of taste and flavor development, um, which is a skill that's developed over the, over the course of the last 25 years of my life and my career. And so, um, and that's the purpose why that's the reason why we call it. I called the company Ultimo and uh, why I do what I do. Yeah, that truly is ultimate. That is phenomenal. And just listen to the artistry that comes out of your, uh, um, conversation on the creation of cigars is inspiring. And so I just want to thank you for that. And I know our listeners are as well. And it just begs the question is how to, uh, guys like ourselves though, um, uh, not just uh, how how do we go to a cigar shop and find the right cigar? You know, I I enjoy drinking scotch from time to time, but I mean, and I would presume that there's certain pairings that do really well. But how do you go about finding those pairings? Does it just take an aficionado such as yourself that you can uh, connect with, or like at your store, do you have those listings? Sure. Um, so we we. If somebody comes into our, our venue, we'll have a conversation. Um, yeah. So, if, you know, it's 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 somebody coming in and saying, hey, I have a, you know, we're, I'm going to a bachelor party or I've got a friend's birthday or my husband is a cigar smoker. You know, it becomes, OK, well, what do they smoke? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what kind of cigars they smoke. Yeah. Well, what kind of what kind of food do they enjoy? What kind of beer do they drink? What kind of scotch are they going to drink? What getting mm. an idea of somebody's palate, and it may not necessarily be what they're going to have with the cigar, but it may be: Are they more of a red meat eater, or are they more into fish or chicken? And, and that gives you an idea of their palate. Similar to wine in in the wine industry, uh, you know, with your meal you're going to have a specific type of wine to pair with a steak. For example, you want Cabernet because it has tannin and acidity, and that and that's going to help clean the fat of a ribeye steak, for example. The ribeye steak is heavy on the palate, coats the palate with, with fats, and you want something with tannin and acidity that's going to come through and clean the palate between bites. And that's kind of the way, if you look at it in terms of like that, when you're pairing the cigar with a uh, whatever you're going to drink with it, whether it be soda, juice, or whatever, uh, take into consideration those aspects. Um, if you're going to have something that's going to be a little bit more spicy, like a rye whiskey, um, if you get a spicy cigar, it's going to compound on top of the spice of the whiskey, and it may be overwhelming, and you can kind of burn and fatigue the palate. So maybe you want something that's a little bit more creamy, a little bit lighter, and that's going to kind of uh, create balance. Um, you know, for some people, they want more of the same and some people want more of a complementary pairing. We make cigars uh, in, in, in partnership with breweries and distilleries that are meant to pair with their products. Um, and so, you know, like with uh, Red Fork Distillery here in Tulsa, we make a cigar that pairs with their weeded bourbon. Mm. Um, and so the bourbon can tend to be a little bit hot on the mid palate. So the cigar is meant to really coat the palate with residual oils, and that helps cool the alcohol burn of the bourbon itself. But also the idea was to bring out more oak flavors and more of uh, the sweet corn. So by triggering different aspects of the palate, we're able to make a much more uh, cohesive experience when you're pairing the two together. And so uh, cons on the consumer side, the best way to go about making that type of selection is understanding either the cigar really well 
and selecting a beverage to pair with the cigar or understanding the beverage really well and selecting a cigar that's going to pair with a beverage. And, and that's going to be a matter of where you want to be on, on that spectrum. Because um, a lot of times people go into a cigar shop with something in mind, either the cigar in mind or the beverage in mind. Um, and so you want to select one of the two and then work around that. And that's kind of the best advice I can offer. Yeah. That's, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, because I think uh, for me, often when I used to go to a cigar shop all the time, it was like bold, medium, and mild. <laughs> and that was, yeah. You know, that was the extent of it. And and without a, somebody such as yourself, you can often be just quite literally hit or miss, and, and it can ruin your cigar experience um, if, sure. if you don't know what you're looking for. So I appreciate all of those uh, those suggestions. Absolutely. And I will suggest also uh, when you do go to a cigar shop, you're selecting a cigar with regard to construction. I always tell people to look at the foot of the cigar. The foot of the cigar is the open side um, and, and look at the, the, uh, the tobacco coloration. So what happens oftentimes, um, a cigar is, con- is constructed with the individual leaves side by side, kind of indiscriminate inside the body of a cigar. Our method is very different. But in traditional factories, they're side by side. So you can get some really dense, oily tobacco concentrated in one part of the cigar and some lighter, thinner tobacco concentrated in another part of the cigar. And that can cause a run down one side of your cigar where it burns all down one side and not the other side because it's uneven. Or it can cause tunneling down the middle of your cigar. So I always tell people when you're selecting a cigar, uh, once you determine which cigar you're going to have, look at the foot of the cigar. And make sure that you get an even distribution of the tobaccos in the cigar and you don't see a high concentration of one type of leaf in one part of the cigar. Um, that's a good indication that the cigar will have burnt, burnt errors. Um, and so that's a little tip on, on cool. selecting selecting the individual cigar once you determine which brand and which variety of cigar you're going you're gonna to have. That's amazing. It's a, uh, yeah, t- talking is like a master class. Like that's what you it want is. when you go into a cigar shop. And a lot of times they're just employees or just, you know, don't know anything yeah. about it. And they're just there to take your order. But, but like to have talk to somebody who like just know has the depth of knowledge you have is just amazing. Um, and I, and I have been in your shop and it smells so good. Like I could just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. But when, uh, one, one question I have practical questions, kind of embarrassing. But uh, more than once, I've gotten myself sick with cigars, and I would mm-hmm. love your tip uh, tips on avoiding that because uh, it's pretty miserable <laughs> to, sure. to be sick after cigars. So. Yeah, so what that is, is called Nixic. It's a mild form of nicotine poisoning uh, that occurs, uh, and it's just something that if your body doesn't have uh, the – the resistance and resilience to the to the natural nicotine in the tobacco, you can get a mild form of nicotine poisoning, which will give you headache, uh, dizziness, queasiness in the stomach. Um, they say the best way to, the best way to offset that is with sugar, um, and so bringing your sugar levels up, uh, either drink a soda, uh, put a little sugar under your tongue, uh, is the best way to kind of mitigate that form of nicotine poisoning uh, that mild nicotine poisoning and so it's essentially just bringing up your glucose levels and stuff and, and it'll help balance that out uh, what that comes from is a lot of in most factories they leave that central midrib vein in the tobacco so the, the midrib leaf uh, vein in the leaf is gonna um, is a channel by which all the nutrients travel from the stock to the leaf and then back And so what happens as the tobacco goes through the natural fermentation, which is essentially just drying the leaf, kind of like you would a rose in a closet if you want to preserve it. It's the same process. They call it fermentation, but it's not any chemical fermentation that's occurring. So the leaf is drying from the outer edge inward where all those nutrients then concentrate to that midrib vein. And so when you leave that vein in the leaf, uh, sometimes it has a much higher concentration of nicotine as well as chlorophyll, alkaline, and ammonia. And those are just natural occurring chemicals. And uh, and so we take that central vein out of every leaf in all of our cigars to reduce the concentration of those chemical compounds to make a much smoother, cleaner uh, cigar. Um, Every other factory in the world does not do that. And so 
really that's what's going to boost that nicotine content. And so if you do have that experience, it may not necessarily be because that brand or that particular cigar is a strong cigar. It could be just that one cigar had a little bit more of that vein content than the last one you had of that same brand. Uh, and so it's kind of, again, indiscriminate when they're placing those leaves into a cigar in, most, in every other factory. Um, I designed our cigars and, and engineered our cigars to be different for that purpose because I am focused on the flavor and the experience that you're having uh, on the taste of the cigar and the experience you're having when you're when you're smoking that cigar and not necessarily uh, focusing on the cost effectiveness and the productive uh, production numbers and things like that. And so it is time consuming to remove that vein. Uh, it reduces your output, which then of course costs more in labor. In addition to the fact that it weighs about a third the, the weight of the vein. So when you're buying leaf by the pound, uh, you throw, we throw away about a third of what we're paying for um, just to be able to have a much better quality experience for our customers. Um, and so that way you're less likely to have that problem that issue of being sick smoking a cigar yeah i'm just so grateful listening to this great question sam and excellent answer tomas and i tell you i don't know if you have a, a how-to course uh, or if there's even a market for it but you should create a starter kit and send it out to to people with instructions <laughs> that you're walking through i think that would be a lot of value i'm i'm just real impressed with your knowledge and with the way you, you. communicate um so i appreciate that but we are the catholic gentlemen so i definitely want to talk about your faith you've alluded sure. to being at uh um the monastery You've alluded to, you know, blessings here or there and stuff like that. Tell us a little bit about your journey um, and your faith life and, and you know, where it's come from and, and where it is now. Sure. Well, I grew up Catholic uh, in California and Arizona, um, you know, Hispanic Catholic family and uh, I'm going to church on Sundays, communion and all of it. And, um, uh, you know, in Hispanic faith or Hispanic culture, you know, the girls will go through having a quinceanera, yeah. which is uh, kind of a becoming coming of a woman, and it's tied to the Catholic Church as well. Uh, and so, growing up in that environment, um, it, it's it's always given a sense of tradition, and, and that's one thing that I, I've always been uh, appreciative uh, is that in the Catholic faith there is a lot of tradition involved. There's a lot of ritual involved uh, when you go to church. Uh, which I've I've experienced in other other forms of Christianity, um, and, and that's one thing that's always brought me back to to the Catholic faith mm -hmm. aspect of it, and, and and is because you know there's a lot of uh, showmanship that occurs in in many churches today, uh, many different denominations of Christianity, uh, and to me that that's always been kind of a little bit off-putting um, because I kind of like like the idea of of tradition, um, and so for me personally, um, I find faith to be very individual. Individual uh, preferences. Uh, my individual preference is to kind of internalize my faith more, um, as opposed to a lot of people become very dependent on external factors to to guide them uh i believe that the, the church and religion is a means to help strengthen and support your internal compass and uh and, and that's always been my belief system with it and so that's why for me i always look i'm able to always look for the blessings in things always able to look for the uh the message behind um, even failures, uh, because to me, it's, it's something that, that I live with internally and, and any of the external, uh, factors that, that the faith and the, the religion and the church are there to offer is meant to help strengthen and help enforce my internal compass. And, and that's always been my belief when it comes to that. And, and I, it's kind of how I carry myself and, and my faith, um, and how I, allow that to guide other aspects of my life. Excellent. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it, you see even the parallels between what you're describing with like learning, learning the art of cigar making 
it was like this apprenticeship and you had to in, in receive all of this information and knowledge and wisdom. It's like a tradition in itself, learning how to make a good cigar. And like you see that as well with the Catholic faith, where it's like there is this structure, there is this tradition, there is this ritual that if you're open to it, not everybody is. But if you're open to receiving that wisdom that the church has to instill and impart, like you likewise are like apprentice to the church and like you learn from the wisdom of the church, just as you learn from the wisdom of these master cigar makers. Um, and and it, it forms and shapes your spiritual life in a way that kind of a individualistic religion where you're just kind of making it up, you know, like is, is not the same. Like you try to sit down and make a cigar and like, I'm just going to do my own thing. Who cares what everyone else says? You know, like probably wouldn't be a very tasty cigar. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Trial and error, you know, is, is a hard way to learn. Agreed. So to finish, tell us where men can find more about um, your, your cigar company. Where, where can they go to, and uh, taste the fruits, if you will, of what you're sure, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, you can always visit our website. It's ultimosigars.com. Uh, we're also on social media on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok as well. Um, I post a lot of stuff about what's going on from day to day, as well as some educational stuff as well. Um, on Instagram, you can go all the way back to the day I got my permits. Um, and then two days later where I lost my job. <laughs> and so you can follow the entire story, um, wow. from, from the beginning. And, uh, you know, and I think that sharing and documenting and, and it's a big part of our community. It's a big part of life today. And, uh, and I think that that's being open, being an open book, um, through the social media, through, um, people walking in our door here in Tulsa and just being uh, open to conversation and open to sharing our, my story and, and what we're doing and what we're going looking to has always been um, the, the connector between myself and the people who smoke my cigars yeah. uh, because they can, they feel connected to it through hearing what it took to get here and where we plan on going in the future. Mm -hmm. And it may not always be the case. You know, I may have, Grand, plans of grandeur but uh and it may not work out that way but uh you know you got you got to hope for the best and, and plan for the worst mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, wow. uh, but yeah you can find us at uh, ultimosigars.com and on social media as uh at ultimosigars wow well just thank That's you awesome. yeah i just want to point out for those who are watching on youtube um uh, if you're listening to this, uh, you look it up on YouTube. But but uh, Tomas was sitting in the cigar rolling room uh, in his factory. Yeah. Uh, and you saw it at the beginning. You might have seen someone back there. He was actually rolling cigars live. So if you're yeah, curious what that looks yeah. like, uh, we maybe we'll do a video tour soon. Um, sure. And, yeah, I can show you our aging room real quick if you like. Okay. Oh, okay, we're getting into it live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is our... Uh, our tobacco room. And so in here we have tobaccos from all over the world and it's all kept in perforated baskets or hanging from the ceiling. So that way it's allowed to uh, vent out any of the ammonia and gases and stuff. And the equipment we use is actually from surgical equipment in a uh, hospital environment uh, uh -huh. to be able to maintain our humidification. Um, Cause in the hospital, they need to humidify to, uh, the rooms, but they can't contaminate the room. And so for us, we need to hum humidify the tobacco, but not uh, contaminate the tobacco. That's amazing. Uh, inspiring. So it's, a little it bit, inspiring. it's a little bit more elaborate than your uh, regular like home humidi humidifi humidifier yeah. that you would have in your bedroom. <laughs> wow. So good. And I'll second Sam on us being able to make it there one of these days and in the future Please. and and have you show us how to roll and all of those things that would yeah, be just a, an incredible blessing so definitely i would appreciate that yeah wonderful well thank you so very much for joining us today really grateful for you and all that you're doing and for the wisdom that you were able to share with us it really meant a lot and so um yeah again thank you yeah i appreciate you guys having me on and uh hope you have a blessed day yeah, you too. As we end each of our episodes. Be a man, be a saint.